Welcome to Life Club. This is George G. And the time is right. Welcome to today's guest, strong and powerful Koppel Kalei. Koppel, are you ready to do this? Yes. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you on. Let's go. Koppel is the COO of Tremendous. They're a company empowering businesses to send one-off payments to people around the world for completing surveys, participating in research, doing take-home projects, and booking demos. And he is a passionate expert in building remote companies. Couple, tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work, why you do what you do. Yeah, for sure. So I founded the company that became Tremendous um, 12 years ago, believe it or not, uh, with one of my good friends from college, uh, Nick Baum. And you know we've had a, a sort of long journey, but um, in that course of time, um, we've gone we've gone through sort of a couple phases of the company. You know, the early startup phase of it was you know me, Nick, uh, and another co-founder, Jonathan, living in the same house together in San Francisco. Um, there was actually a period where we ended up. Uh, no one worked on the company for uh, actually one employee worked on the company for almost two and a half years, um, mm. and, and it was on maintenance mode. And then Nick returned to the company in uh, from 2015. Uh, through now, and then I actually returned to the company as well um, about two years ago, a year and a half ago. And we've been pretty much remote since 2013. Um, and, and my other sort of background um, is uh, I, during my hiatus from Tremendous, I uh, was the COO of Angelus Talent, um, which is the largest, largest startup uh, recruiting platform and job site um, out there. Nice, I love it. So three years in San Francisco doing a startup. I'm sure that was an awesome experience. And now what uh, brought you to New York? You know, um, th there's a couple things that brought me here. I originally grew up on the East Coast and I, um, so I went to school out here. And so California was this place that you go. And actually, I think increasingly for people building their careers now, like you need to spend some time in California because that's where you get a real taste of, you know, how things work in Silicon Valley, but more and more, um, it used to be that you had to stay in California as a company or as an engineer. And I knew that I wanted to move back and, you know, be closer to my family and all my friends from high school and college who ended up settling around New York. Um, so I ended up moving back in 2015. Also at that time, I think San Francisco has been on, you know, no offense to those in San Francisco, but it's been on the decline as a city in terms of quality of life. And uh, New York is just this amazing place where you get people from every culture, every sort of uh, place on, on earth, every interest group uh, to kind of come to one uh, city and coexist. Uh, I think that's amazing. So that's why I wanted to be back here. It all makes sense. Uh, you mentioned engineer. Do you have an engineering background? I don't. Um, I'm actually the son of two computer scientists, and I've been coding since I was a kid. Hmm. Uh, but they talked me out of pursuing a degree uh, in computer science, believe it or not, because it's funny growing up on the East Coast, um, there's like two notions of like what it means to be a programmer. Um, on the West Coast, there's like this amazing, like sexy Mark Zuckerberg or um, you know, Vinod Kosla, like these people who are building these companies, like uh, Larry and Sergey, um, that are building these companies that end up becoming like world changing. And on the East Coast, especially when you talk about the finance world, it's actually the business people that end up running the show. And it's more of like the office space situation of the programmers are working in the back office. My parents never wanted that for me. So they, they talked me out of it, but I loved it so much that, you know, I, I just got back into it the moment that I started working on startups. So that was my path back into uh, being becoming an engineer. How funny! I've never I've never thought about it or heard it broken out like that. But when I hear it, it makes perfect sense. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Story look, if, coast. if you grow up, you think about it. You grow up around Stanford and Berkeley, and all these people leave and they found companies. And look, even in the in the nineteen nineties. Um, the notion of the programmer was like, well, you might start the initial idea, but eventually you get like a venture capitalist comes in and they put in a professional CEO. And so there's this other time thing of like, well, in the 90s and 2000s when my parents were engineers, it wasn't a common thing for like the engineer to also become the sort of leader and business person. And that has been another shift over time um, where, you know, now you look at like back when I graduated in 2007, I think like call it 3% of uh, Dartmouth um, undergraduates studied computer science. And that is like a tiny portion where it's like now it's like 10, 15, hmm. very different. Yeah. It, it's interesting to, to, to watch things change and evolve. And certainly the way that uh, 
the way that we're working in remote work that's on the tip of everybody's tongue right now. Um, you know, and like everything else, people either love it or they think it's really stupid. Um, when did you start thinking about it? So my history with companies is I worked in a very small startup environment where there are three of us living in a house working on uh, the company that became tremendous. And um, I then took a uh, software engineering job at AngelList where it was pretty much an in-office culture in San Francisco. Um, and then I moved to New York, which was like a satellite office of AngelList. And I did the sort of, I worked out of a satellite office where there's a main headquarters in San Francisco. And I traveled six times a year, hmm. roughly to San Francisco. And then we started AngelList Talent, which became its own business eventually, became like a hub in New York that was mostly in person with its own satellite offices. And then during the pandemic, AngelList Talent got rid of its office and transitioned to a full remote model. And then when I came back to Tremendous in 2020, it was about nine full-time employees, all remote. And now we have scaled that to 50-something uh, with plans to be well over 100 um, next year. So I've seen the sort of gamut of all of these configurations over the course of my professional career. Yeah. So, so you are for it, obviously. You 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 think that it's it's functional. You think that it's an environment where people can succeed and thrive in it as an individual contributor and the company as as a whole. It is. I, you know, what I would say is that for most companies, especially um, growing ones or maturing ones, it is the right configuration. Mm -hmm. um, there are some config, there's some times in a company's lifetime that it's probably not the right configuration. Now, I'll, I'll walk you through some examples. If you are like starting on a company, you know, starting work on a company, you're an entrepreneur and you're, it is so valuable to have your co founder and maybe an early employee in the same city. And the reason for that is that the nature of the work is like, it's very creative. The number of iterations that you need to have is like, you, you're gonna go back and forth on every decision. And there's like, you need to, it's very valuable to be in the same room early on. And even now, you know, Nick, my co-founder, he and I are typically in the same city most through most of the year. Um, so we spend a fair amount of time together working on like complex issues. Now, when you get to a, a larger organization, call it 10, 20 people, and you have product market fit in the thing that you're building, meaning you have revenue coming in, you have customers, the nature of the work becomes a little less like you're doing creative brainstorming in a room. And then the goal of the company is actually to start attracting the highest quality talent that it can. Now, the thing that I know happened when we were in uh, at Angelus and recruiting exclusively in New York, it was really hard to find people that had, you know, the engineers that had a skill set in our uh, tech stack, um, wanted to work at the company, and like were within commuting distance to like the location of the office that we chose. Now, at Tremendous, we recruit from every city um, within like you know, four or three time zones, uh, either way of um, New York City. So we go out to the West Coast, and then we go north and south up through North America, South America, um, Central America, the Caribbean, wherever, Canada. And the pool of talent is so much bigger that it is like an amazing opportunity to just find people that are going to be able to contribute at a much higher level. I keep hearing from companies I speak with um, who are, you know, recruiting in their local markets that it's hard to find any senior talent. They don't really like it's hard, you know, it's hard to get them to work at your company and there's a limited pool. Well, you know, the moment you 20x your pool, 100x your pool, it becomes a lot easier to find those people. And so the number one advantage of being a remote company is that you just get access to talent that you wouldn't have otherwise. And that makes life a lot easier when you have, you know, some amount of uh, understanding over what you are building. What what do you what do you think or know that 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 you're missing from the physical environment? And I appreciate you telling me at the beginning it's the creativity and the proximity and and, and you're iterating. Once once you are a little bit bigger, what what are you missing out on, and how do you compensate for that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you do miss out on things. So um, one thing that you miss out on is 
the interaction that you end up having with your coworkers when you're all going to the same office together ends up making it a lot easier for you to make friends at work. And so one of the things I believe about remote work is actually like, it, okay, the second thing you miss out on is any sort of really high bandwidth um, like work that you need to do, whether it's like, think about it as an apprenticeship uh, mentor model, like it's really valuable to be in the same room with someone that you are learning from when you were learning the job. And as such, I generally don't think remote work is a great fit for people who are just starting out with their careers. Like you should probably work in an office with like people who um, you can learn from because your rate of learning is much faster. Um, that said, you know, the way that Tremendous works now is we just typically hire senior people. Like think about it this way. There's so many talented parents out there, but the the poles of being a parent I mean you constantly got to take time out of your day to go to a certain place. And suddenly if you're dealing with a commute where you have to go to a specific office and like, what do you do when your kid gets sick? Or, you know, there's some issue with daycare or whatever it is. Well, remote work makes that easier. So what we typically find is we're able to recruit more senior employees who don't have that same need for like a filling the social part of their life. And they're typically more advanced in their careers. And so they're not like, they might have skills that they're developing, but it's like one skill. They're not just trying to like figure out how the world works. So um, I think one compromise is on the social piece, um, but the flip side of it is when you hire really senior people who are kind of further along in their lives, that tends to lead to, um, you know, the better work output anyway. Yeah. So having the right selection, uh, understanding that that you're making great selection decisions on the front end and hiring really top tier senior people who are competent and committed and it gives them the flexibility to to not have to commute and gives them the flexibility if they have kids to, to deal with that kind of stuff, which I certainly understand. Is there a certain technology that, 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 that you embrace over others? How do you think about meetings and collaborating? Yeah. So I, you might be familiar with this um, term skeuomorphism. It's like when you have some new technology and you take like an adaptation of like will be the old world work and you put it like exactly kind of into the new technology. And a good example of that is like, um, I think when, um, computers first came out, like there was this notion of like the bookshelf in your computer where you would literally see like the books that you could pull in the same thing in like your iPhone eventually. Um, and then at some point people were like, wait, there's like blog posts, there's Kindle, like these are, this is how it should work because it's just words on a page that you need to digest. Um, well, the same thing I think is true of people who consider like this remote work environment and they try to take the things that worked in the old office environment and just adapt them directly. Mm. And the number one thing is meetings. Meetings and like brainstorming sessions when you are in a um, in an office culture, they don't they feel comfortable like you can have um the, the nature of like being in a room with people means that multi-way conversations can happen breakouts between two people just chatting about something organically work but if you're in a 30 person meeting that's like on zoom it is one screen talking at a time usually disseminating information from one to many the second piece the second issue with that is it's just exhausting this notion of zoom fatigue of like being in that sort of like you know watching a screen and trying to pay attention all day it's just much, it's much more unpleasant than actually being in person. Um, and, and so I think that the biggest change for us, like in terms of technology is realizing that when we communicate information or disseminate information, a meeting is not the right way to do it. You typically need to use a different sort of version of media. And it could be writing. We write a lot at Tremendous. It could be a screencast. We use a tool called Loom to like actually walk people through like mock-ups or something like, like, uh, you know, company strategy, or, um, you know, we actually even have, uh, have had internal podcasts that we uh, release that allow people to listen, you know, whenever they're working out to like what's happening at the company. That's a very different model than like, well, everyone's in the same office to just pull them into like an all hands. So I think that that is like one of the big technology changes that um, it's not quite a technology change, but it is a um, a change in how we work that relates to technology. Do people miss meetings? No. <laughs> no, no. I mean, look, there's a few people who do miss the social interaction, but, you know, again, the, so the, the other thing that we do, and this is, again, not a, a technology fix, but you do need to have people bond and spend time with each other. And we do 
three to four company offsites per year. And the way that these offsites work, two of them, they're all companies. We're going to Mexico City in a couple of weeks. Um, and that's people from all over the world uh, going there. We don't work. There aren't meetings. They're like company summer camp is a good way to think about it. That's in a fun city. And the only goal is to get people together and have them understand each other, get to know each other and start trusting each other, see each other as, as real humans, as opposed to just you know, pictures on a screen. And I found no substitute for that to date. Yeah, I think that that's a, I think that that is a, a cool and what I imagine will be really a successful substitute or replacement for, um, or solution to creating community and feeling like, 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 like you're a part of something. So, and now that travel is, again becoming something that's that, that that's that's a real thing we're, we're we're able to do that what are some of the other key things that 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 you're working on that you think makes remote work successful i think one thing is you need to change your interviewing and hiring practices to actually screen for people who want to work and can be successful at working in that environment um oftentimes there's some set of people um, who want to actually work in an office or want to be able to go into an office two or three times a week. And the thing that I've learned is if you try to get those people, and oftentimes these are like extroverts who don't want to sit in like, a, you know, their own office and want to have like much more regular social interaction, or it could be like people who have a lot of learning to do and want to be in a more apprenticeship model. Um, the thing that I've learned is that it's important to be upfront with people about that in the interview process, because it's, you know, look, um, when you have a pool of candidates, that's like 50 X bigger than what you used to have before. You can find people that are the exact right cultural fit, um, who have the skills that you need. So I, I think that's one. The second is that you need to look for people who can communicate effectively over this medium. And that typically means having outstanding writing skills. That's really big. Um, so one of the things we do at Tremendous, for example, is every single hire, for regardless of what role it is, um, the interview process includes something that actually has you put together a document or you know some sort of writing sample to get a sense of how effective will you be over this new medium. Love it. I think that that makes a ton of sense. All right, give us uh, give us some of the the, the use cases and uh, why people are are coming to Tremendous as as customers and clients. For sure, I'll walk you through it. Um, so Tremendous is a payouts platform. Um, this means we help organizations issue payouts to people around the world. Now, let's say that you are a user researcher at Google and you're building the next version of Google Search. And in order to do that, you have to have conversations with people all over the world. Um, to understand what they need out of a search tool. Thing is, in order to have those conversations, these people are providing input and time, and you need to compensate them for, for this time somehow. Um, the issue is that all of these people might be in different places in the world, and they all want to get paid in different ways. Plus, payments is a regulated space. You can't just use your payroll provider. Like, it, it's, it gets complicated, and that's where Tremendous comes in. Um, we're able to uh, solve this problem for Google by connecting all of the different payout methods that these people may need, ACH, Venmo, gift cards, prepaid cards, and our software handles the money movement, compliance, regulatory, and reporting parts of the problem. So if you are trying to do user research, all you have to do is upload a list of emails and amounts, and Tremendous takes care of the rest. And that's why Google's user research team with, I think, like 5,000 or so other organizations use Tremendous. I love it. Beautiful. Well, Kapil, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn more about you? How can they engage with you? And how can they learn engage with Tremendous? Uh, Tremendous is at Tremendous.com. Um, and it is you know free for anyone to sign up and try. So I encourage uh, people to it's used for all sorts of use cases beyond research, um, you know, marketers, uh, salespeople, HR people all use it. Um, and for myself, I'm on Twitter as Koppel, K-A-P-I-L. Excellent. Well, if you enjoyed this much as I did, show Koppel your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas, go to Tremendous.com. Uh, did you get that URL? Just just <laughs> bought it or did, did you have to buy it from somebody else? A long, complicated story. 
but yeah, it, it took it took years. And then you got Koppel on Twitter as well. So you are you are killing that game for sure. I love it. So go to tremendous.com and check out the great resources. Follow Koppel on Twitter at K A P I L and uh See how you can enrich your work life experience uh, and and potentially switch and utilize some of the tools he's been talking about in your remote work and then how to send one off payments all over the world. Thanks again, couple. Thank you. And until next time, remember, do your part by doing your best. <laughs>